you trust your life with it every day. When you drive to work, cross a river, and take a drink of water. Bridges, pipes, highways, parts of our country's massive infrastructure that keeps our economy together. Going to a school that has a World War II bomb shelter. What kind of shape is it in? The priorities are not there. This week we're along the Missouri River between Nebraska and Iowa. Levees are being repaired here after record flooding caused major damage. In the past 20 years around here, it's improved a lot. What needs to be done to make sure our infrastructure is ready for the future? This is The Race. Welcome to The Race, I'm Chris Stewart. Our nation's infrastructure makes many parts of our lives possible, and this week we're looking at the current state of that system. Now here along the Missouri River between Nebraska and Iowa, levees are a very important part of infrastructure, and historic flooding earlier this year proved that. My family's farm is underwater. My mom and dad are displaced. My, my brother's displaced from his home. It's a struggle. 2019 left its mark on the plains. Everybody's in the same boat, you know. Look at, look at all the free houses in the south end town, it's gone. Since March of last year, more than 500 miles of levee systems along the Missouri, Platte, and Elkhorn rivers were damaged by flooding. The storm that came through that was known uh, was called a bomb cyclone. A storm that brought a dangerous combination of heavy rain and melting snow that breached the levee system protecting land behind it. This was the result. More than a billion dollars in damage, destroying crops and killing livestock. More than nine months later, this is the reality we saw about an hour from Omaha. Farmland still covered with water. Areas now turning to ice as winter sets in. What you're kind of seeing where we're standing, this is the, the elevation that the, the levee was at before the event happened. And then you can kind of see behind us, uh, if you look across over there, how much it was cut down as the water was flowing through. The Army Corps of Engineers is one of the groups working on the rebuild, a job that's expected to continue through much of 2020. And we're estimating that by the time we're all said and done with the repairs, it'll be over a billion dollars. There's a lot of things behind these, these levees that they're very important in the nation. For the farmers impacted by a wet 2019, it could be years before their land is ready and fertile again. As far as this place and income potential on this farm, I would say it's pretty much gone. The thought of trying to do anything out here is no longer even reasonable thought. America received a D plus on the newest infrastructure report card. Annie Taylor has just how much a nationwide overhaul would cost. Chris, the American Society of Civil Engineers puts out our infrastructure report card every four years. The latest one in 2017, a D plus overall. PolitiFact found it would take $558 billion or more to fix up the nation's roads, bridges and dams. The report card gave roads a D. It says it would take $420 billion to get all of America's roads back up to par. One in five highways are in poor condition. Now America's bridges got a C on the report card. 235,000 bridges are in need of repair. It will cost up to $171 billion to clear the backlog. The latest numbers show more bridges are in fair condition than good, and more than 7% are in poor condition. It would take an estimated 80 years to fix all bridges that are rated poor at the current rate of repair. Dams got a D on the national report card, and it was $45 billion in fixes. The Association of State Dam Safety estimates it would take 70 billion to fix all dams in need. Experts told PolitiFact that catching up on deferred maintenance should be a top priority. I'm Annie Taylor for The Race. You might not think of the water supply when you think of infrastructure, but Alicia Nieves found out it is an issue that impacts Americans everywhere. About five years ago in Flint, Michigan, Almost 100,000 people in the Great Lakes state learned they were exposed to elevated levels of lead in their water. A bottle of water for two apples. Today in Newark, New Jersey, you have to rinse fruit. More than 200,000 residents like Yvette Jordan are dealing with a similar water crisis. You follow what was happening in Flint, Michigan. 
Did at any point you think that that could potentially happen here in Newark, New Jersey to you? I never thought that, ever. I just thought it was some something horrible because of a series of incidents in, in their government and it would never affect here. In 2018, tests of Newark's water revealed lead levels upwards of four times the EPA's allowable limit. And since, Residents like Jordan have had to use bottled water for almost every act that involves ingesting or possibly ingesting water. You get up, you brush your teeth. Oops, I need bottled water so I can brush my teeth. I shower, okay, I shower, I use regular water. Supposedly, I've got to flush the water. The issue is more than annoying to deal with. It's dangerous. Continued consumption of water with elevated levels of lead could lead to serious and irreversible health repercussions. Simply put, water is life and safe water really is a human right. After Yvette Jordan and others sued, Newark came up with a plan to rip up city streets and replace all 18,000 lead lines, lines that are more than 100 years old. But the threat of lead in drinking water is bigger than Newark and Flint. Across the country, there's an estimated 6 million lead service lines in similarly aging water systems. So what you see here in Newark may happen in your own city, in your own town. For The Race, I'm Alicia Nieves. Infrastructure also helps keep our cars on the road. Jace Larson shows us the push to shut off the gas pumps and crank up the power. It's a service station unlike any other in the United States. Once a gas station, RS Automotive in Southern Maryland is now the first fully converted electric vehicle charging station in the country. This will maybe encourage other people to do, to follow suit and, you know, come up with more charging stations. Depeswar Doli owns the station. He says he got fed up with dealing with gasoline and the infrastructure that it takes. Because of the low volume and the cost of expense to maintain the machines and the pumps and the underground storage tanks, it was too much. So he ditched his gas tanks and installed these electric charging stations. Doli says he's looking at the road ahead and he thinks that electric is the way to go. A lot of the car manufacturers are all rushing to, you know, convert to electric vehicles. Currently, most major car manufacturers make electric vehicles. There are more than a million of them on the road in the United States. But electric vehicles still only make up 1% of the total cars. That number is expected to soar to 42% by the year 2040. This is our, our only first electric car. Steven Sauter bought his electric vehicle two years ago and says he immediately started saving money on gas and maintenance. We are, we are ecstatic. Steven found this new charging station on his cell phone, becoming one of the first customers to use the new station. I saw that it was a brand new station and that it was very high speed. And I thought that's for us. As demand grows, electric charging systems are expected to double in the coming years, replacing underground tank systems with chargers. For The Race, I'm Chase Larson. Bringing high-speed internet to places that don't have it, next on The Race.